for joining us. Um, we'll get started in just a minute, um, but we're going to have Pad go up first. Pad, um, are you are you prepared to talk about the upcoming education interim committee? Yeah, you bet, Dylan. Awesome. Let's we'll get started in just one minute. See if anyone else is able to jump on. All right, it looks like we've got just about everybody on. Um, yeah, Pat, do you wanna just give a little bit of an update on what's coming up with the Education Interim Committee? Yeah, you bet. Good morning, everybody. Um, the Education Interim Committee is gonna meet uh, this Thursday afternoon, April 30th, and then again on uh, Tuesday next week, May 5th, again, one to 4 p.m. roughly in the afternoon. Um, the agendas for both those meetings are posted. And just to clarify, like how to participate in these meetings, if you simply want to watch, uh, you can just stream it through the legislative website. If you want to um, participate and have the ability to provide public comment when it is invited, you need to email me and I'll shoot you the Zoom meeting uh, access link. And um, if you're a panelist, you know, on the agenda, I will be giving you the link for sure. So. Um, on Thursday, uh, we'll be looking, the committee asked for some information on possible redesign of the selection mechanism for HB 351 and 387, and Laura sankey Kipe, who's on this call, I believe, um, prepared a document uh, with some possibilities and considerations on that. We'll be looking at school funding cleanup, and then we'll be uh, looking at uh, pre-kindergarten. The committee asked uh, in January for information on state models that um, provide a mixed delivery system for pre-K that is coordinated led by local districts. So we tried to identify several states uh, that have models uh, in that manner. And uh, I think we'll, we'll present for maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and then there's a lot of time open for uh, public comment on that. Um, Tuesday's agenda is really just two kind of large panels of folks. We're gonna look at school food, especially focusing on school breakfast, and then, uh, and then have a panel on student well-being uh, amidst COVID-19 and closure, and got some students, uh, Linda Rost, I think Linda's on the call now, um, school counselor, uh, some administrators on that and excited just to hear some voices, uh, you know, from the ground um, on that. That's what we got going on at interim committee. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate that update. Um, I know we'll have plenty of our specialists participating in those meetings. Um, are there any questions for Pat? I have one, Pat. When it comes to the transparency in Zoom meetings with policymakers, uh, I know you participated in LFC subcommittee as well as the LFC committee most recently. How do you think that's going? I mean, are, is everybody just kind of fitting into this routine of Zoom meetings, but within the vote or moving, um, having people from the public give comment? Um, how do you, I know, how do you feel it's going? You know, I mean, I think I think we're still working out some wrinkles, um, although I, I think it's pretty good. I think the key is to read the agenda and understand the dynamic that I that I explained earlier that if you just want to watch stream it, if you want to be in the meeting and have the ability to offer public comment, then you need to reach out to the committee staffer ahead of time who will provide a link to, to enter the meeting as an attendee. Um, I think some of the other keys are to have, make sure that documents come in 
in a timely manner and that staff are able to post those so that everyone has access to that. Um, when, when, when it's the streaming, it puts the meeting kind of in a small box within the screen. And if you're showing a PowerPoint slide, it's just, I think it's pretty impossible unless you're on a giant TV or something to see what that document is all about. Um, so being able to click on a document through the website um, is key, but all in all, I think it's going pretty well. Thank you. So I do know the month of May is pretty busy with all kinds of interim committees. Some you're associated with and some you're not. Uh, does June and July look as well? I mean, are things being placed upon the calendar for those meetings? Yeah, May is pretty busy with these Zoom meetings. I will say, though, that uh, the education stuff, it's kind of front loaded in early May. Mm -hmm. um, and then for June, I think it's because it's still up in the air a little bit. We're just holding any scheduled June meeting dates as they were previously established with the thought that possibly there will be, I don't know, face to face meetings. That's above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. you know whether that decision gets made that's, that's the plan for june thank you pat i appreciate those insights okay um i was not able to listen in on the mara committee yesterday but um does anyone in general have any any feedback or recap on how that meeting went i'll just say that you know it, it was um there was a a, law, a fairly lengthy conversation about school funding and property taxes um, I presented a largely the same presentation that I gave to the revenue committee during ledge week and another group during legislative week. And then Julia Patton in LFD, who may be on this call, I'm not sure, um, walked through a, a report with some, um, you know, interesting maps and, and uh, charts related to property taxes and school funding. And I'd, I'd urge you to take a look at either her full report or the PowerPoint slides she prepared for that. Um, it's just some interesting stuff. Really not sure where this Mara uh, study committee might might go with that, but that's what happened. Thanks, Pat. Um, any legislative discussions before we jump into the CARES Act? I, I have one. When it comes, maybe I have another one too, but just the one for now. So, Pad, when it comes to agency bills and requests to get them into the hopper, um, are we on the same schedule as we have in previous interims? Or I know, I, I don't know if there's more committee bills that might be coming at this time. I know you're still in that process, but are we, are we following the same type of calendar as we have in the previous interim? Yeah, I would say in general, we are, you know, we're trying to, that's why we prioritize the topics we did for this May or this, this week and next week's meetings was kind of anything that the committee is kicking around that might possibly lead to a committee bill. Let's keep moving on that. And then yes, with agency bills, uh, we've got it on our work plan for the June meeting to have, you know, any agencies that, that want to request, um, yes legislation to present that present the the outline of that at the June meeting excellent so I'm assuming then those cleanup bills uh, will be moved to the front of the hopper and I know we've already presented those uh, the school funding cleanup bills uh, Paul and I will be briefly walking through a document on Thursday that's with right the committee and then they will they will let us know any or all of those that they want sort of prepared in draft form for June. Excellent. So we are having, the OPI is having a three o'clock call tomorrow, uh, call of the legislature. I'll just put that in quotes, even though I can't do that, but have a, a call with the legislators understanding uh, what COVID, what uh, pre-COVID, COVID, and possibly what post-COVID might be. And we have that at three o'clock tomorrow with them. And our agenda is pretty much based on that and some of the CARES dollars that you'll be hearing some more information from, from uh, Mr. Bailey here shortly. So if there's no other discussion on legislative things, Pat, thank you very much. I know you've been really busy and uh, I appreciate you uh, and all of your energy and everything, putting education and of course our students first. Thank you, Pat. 
So Ken, you have uh, some updates on the CARES dollars that Montana's receiving? Good morning. Um, so we received, or the, I should say the Education Department published the application um, for the state funds under the, the what's now being termed ESSER plan for an abbreviation. Um, and we filed that application on Friday. Um, the department has promised a three-day turnaround, so hopefully we will hear back from them tomorrow. Uh, in that application, there, there's lots of things that we have to say we're going to do that are in the CARES Act, such as uh, maintain employment, abide by this, abide by that, and all of the standard federal grant uh, uh, items, you know, regulations, et cetera. What I think was interesting is they had one section where they asked two types of input. The first was, what are you going to ask from LEAs when they apply for their funds to you as a state? and uh, then gave some guidance that suggested a lot of things to ask about. Um, we took an approach to say, what we've heard from our school districts is what they want the most is flexibility. And so we've, in our application, we've stated, we'll ask two things. One is, how are you gonna use the money? And please highlight any remote learning uh, technology or the purchases and stuff that you think you need to make. And the second is, what can OPI provide to you in terms of technical assistance to help this process? Um, there was a second section that asked about the 10% set aside. And understand that in addition to this question, there are some requirements for filing a more detailed report within 60 days. And as you know, we the 10% the set aside is $4.1 million, and we have not made a final determination of what we're going to do with it. So what we stated is, as we said, the first use is going to be to supplement the, the, uh, the amount that's going directly to the LEAs to make sure that each LEA gets a, a minimum of $10,000. Uh, for those that, re that the allocation results in less than $10,000, we bump them up. And for those LEAs that receive no Title I funds in the past, we give them uh, $10,000. And that'll take about $600,000 of the $4.1 million. In addition, uh, there is a provision for a half of a percent for administrative costs. And again, we stated that we will take that half of a percent um, that adds up to $206,000. And in general, we plan to add an FTE to help manage all this, as, as well as look at what other things can, to, are, is it going to cost us? For example, we need to do a modification Sorry, I forgot to, to, our, to our grant management system. Um, then we, we mentioned some possibilities without committing to um, fund them. Um, one was in the area of special education services and the possibility of providing some funds both to, to cooperatives and in an equitable way to those schools that don't participate in cooperatives. The second is some request we've had to consider community-based organizations, not LEAs, and determine if there's some help that needs there. The third was to address districts in need of more, that are more impacted by COVID than other districts. And again, we don't have anything specific to report there. And the last is, is if you remember, we asked the, the districts to tell us what technical assistance can we provide that would help you the most? And the fourth use is uh, providing that technical assistance to the, uh, to the district. So I'll pause there and see if there are any questions. Ken, this is Kirk, and I'm um, just checking. It sounds like very detailed and a lot of great work um, done there. Is that available, the application available, so that we can see what all of the criteria are um, 
that you've submitted? Um, the, what Again, this is up to the superintendent, and of course, any document that we have is a public document. We received a lot of feedback from the CCSSO, like a document that said something to the effect of, here are 20 great things you should consider putting into your application. So actually, what I would prefer to do is to wait and see if this is approved or if we need to modify it. And if if it is approved, then post it so that everyone can see it. But again, that will be up to the superintendent to decide. I mean, maybe not necessary to post it, but for the folks that are on this meeting and have been tracking all of that and are trying to counsel with our members so that we have, you know, a deep understanding of what's happening there, if that could be shared even with just this group, the initial application. And then I agree that, you know, the posting of the approved application um, that would be helpful for everybody's understanding. I'm just having to answer questions, numerous questions on a daily basis around all of those, um, all of the items that you've described um, and not having the ability to actually look at what the, you know, the, the deep criteria were that were in the application. Um, it would be helpful if we could see that. So I guess the request is to the superintendent to be able to share um, LC that information maybe even just with the group who's on the phone here that are tracking these items uh, and then post the actual application uh, once it's approved. Are we unmuted? Yeah. Of course. Thank you, Kirk. Um, being as transparent as possible. And, you know, we have received, I mean, my heavens, I don't know how many vendors have come into our office as well uh, saying that they have the panacea for what uh, opening school doors are going to be or post COVID. It's quite interesting, but uh, we'll get those materials. They'll come in our reflections after this discussion, as well as we'll make sure that they're posted on our website. Thank you for that. And on that, on that note, um, Dylan has had a tremendous amount of Oh, me news media outlets that are wanting to know what the Mountain West is doing as we seem to be uh, more moving more toward our opening of our state. And uh, just understanding the questions that they are asking then are what then, Dylan? They're wanting to know um, if schools are opening. Um, of course, they think that we're controlling all of this at the state level. Right. Um, just wanting to know uh, what schools are opening, um, what partial reopening might look like, um, how we're allocating some of these CARES dollars. So yeah, I received quite a few media inquiries um, nationally. I'm sure some of your organizations have mm -hmm. too, um, saying that they're working on Montana, Wyoming, Idaho specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that also puts on a, on a government lens of what does it mean uh, to have government reopen even though we were an essential uh, form of the of, of Montana wanting to make sure that our employees number one are safe I mean safety is one of my middle names has been since I was a teacher but wanting to make sure that our employees when we reunify the agency what does that look like um, and the fatigue that COVID is uh, putting on screens on, um, on all kinds of devices, wanting to make sure that uh, the employee is of course productive serving schools, but also making sure that they're healthy as well within this part. So Pat, I'm very pleased that the policymakers are looking at what uh, mental health services and what kind of impacts outside of remote learning there are, uh, because we all know when uh, students come into the classroom, we embrace them where they're at, and that could be from anything, from poverty or mental illness or, or anything that a student might bring in. But it's very similar to what's happening, I believe, um, here on the Capitol Complex as well as mimicked across our state in other sectors of, of government. And also then what it means with the private sector opening their doors. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole new thing. Somebody I'm sure is gonna be writing a book about this one or if not a movie. But I do know we have the toys on uh, and these are our teacher leaders. Uh, I, Linda, I saw yours and Dylan, I saw you there. If you have anything to share on what this is looking like, I do believe we're in what are going into our eighth week. 
Almost, yep. Yeah. Um, I can, this is Linda Rost. I can say that I am getting used to online teaching and, and remote learning and my students are too and it's actually going better than I expected. But it's not, the, the quality of learning is not like it would be in the classroom and we're just, you know, we're just getting by. But they are, they're doing a lot better than I expected. So, and, and we are, my school still does, hasn't made a decision yet on whether we're going back. So we're waiting to hear that. Thank you, Linda. Hi, this is Dylan Huskin in Bonner. Um, our school board decides tomorrow, Wednesday, whether or not we're going back. But um, I would echo what Linda said. The learning curve for this is very difficult. It really took longer than I expected for both teachers, myself, and my students to really get the swing of this. Um, so it was, a, it was a bumpy start. And I, I feel like by the time we're really efficient and learning is getting really good, that uh, it'll be June. So um, I'm interested to see what big changes this will bring in the fall. But um, yeah, I think, I think this crisis is really showing communities, parents, uh, school boards, teachers, everybody, just how vital the school building is and why we gather kids physically into, into a building because it's more than just um, a place where learning occurs. It's, it's a community center and yeah, I'm, going to be stewing on what this will mean for education in the future, but things are getting better. And yeah, students are, are getting the hang of it um, more so than they were a few weeks ago. So thanks. Thank you, Dylan. And, and thank you, Linda. So this has all prompted me of, you know, because at this time of year, it's when school doors are starting to close down, but we all reflect on what's going to happen next. And it's not just because of COVID. It's just, that's who we are in education. As, as we hug and embrace these kids, as they, depart, we're going to get a whole new crop in the, in this, in the fall. So we're going to be uh, creating a task force here. And I um, not necessarily uh, want to say that it's going to be a limited task force, but right now we've got about um, 17 uh, school leaders on this, but we want to open it up more to community leaders, uh, teachers as well, parents, students, and it's going to be titled Montana Learn. We don't know what Montana Learn is going to be. The purpose of this is to give guidance to uh, the agency as much to um, the great advocates that are on this Zoom call, as much as to teachers like Linda and Dylan in the classroom, and for parents to understand what does it mean uh, in post-COVID world if we do reach that point, and the benefits and some of the barriers that remote learning has done uh, for and with our, our students. So. There'll be more information that'll be coming out next week on that. And we're very excited to be able to host something as this. We'll have a facilitator and a moderator that will be able to uh, put some great, uh, great ideas up on the board and then we can narrow this down. That uh, in itself then will help determine also for our policymakers. As I said, we're having a conversation with legislators tomorrow um, and we, we have them multiple times but to make sure that they understand what their uh, responsibility might be then when the new legislative session opens in January of 21. But my hats are off to Dylan and Linda, um, understanding that there are so many other teachers behind them and the parents that are at that kitchen table uh, wanting and wishing so much for education to hopefully get some back to normal. But anyway, I applaud everyone, thank you. Thanks. Um, we don't have any other updates at this time. Uh, this morning, Dennis sent around a, a great document that he's working on, a Google spreadsheet for the status of schools for the remainder of the year. Um, so I've, Christy um, in our office is helping Dennis track down that information. So we have um, a good spreadsheet of, of what schools are doing for the rest of the year. Um, are there any updates from any of the other groups on the line right now. Pete, are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, this, is La this is oh. yeah, go this ahead, Lance. Is Lance. Um, just uh, just re relating to what we just discussed about, you know, getting back to normal. Um, one of the things that we're absolutely foreseeing is that uh, is that we basically through this trial period have proven that our schools are capable of operating in an offsite mode. Now that's a, it's a mixed blessing 
I consider it to be a positive development, okay? But here's what's going to happen. Until and unless there is either a game-changing therapeutic remedy that decreases the likelihood of death and hospitalization for COVID, so something like Tamiflu, or until there is herd immunity through a very painful process of two-thirds of the population becoming infected and recovering um, that will be accompanied with deaths, and or the vaccine that everybody is still saying 12 to 18, and they keep pushing that out even though we're now at the end of April, it should be 12 to 18 months from March. The bottom line is, is that Section 503 of the ninth, or Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act is going to give students the right to be accommodated and to make those requests and have them legally actionable. And uh, given the, uh, the demographics of our staff, um, the, uh, the, anybody with an, either an underlying health condition as simple as diabetes, which is a very predominant disease, um, asthma, any other pulmonary uh, disease, or just being 68, 60 years old or, or older, uh, is going to be able to invoke the Americans with Disabilities Act and ask for reasonable accommodation of their disability, as long as being in person requires them to subject themselves to uh, a disproportionate risk of harm. And I think that's going to be something that we better keep that tool sharpened and in our chest uh, for at least the next school year. And for anybody that's opening up on May 7th, um, I don't think that there's any such a thing as opening up <laughs> entirely. There's going to have to be a dual track. And, and thankfully, most of the districts I've spoken to who are contemplating opening up and reopening their schools physically and bringing kids in recognize that they're going to have to accommodate uh, both staff and students who uh, don't want to be back in this environment. And, uh, and, and so, you know, that's one of the things that we're planning and, and in the process of educating our members about is, uh, is recognizing that, uh, that this is a significant issue. The other thing that I think we may need uh, some help administratively in terms of rulemaking um, I mean, we're, we're having a lot of people struggling with the concept of, of instruction. And um, I'm, I'm a bit dismayed by it because I, I think that, you know, if you put a teacher in front of a classroom of 20 kids, nobody asks anything further. Instruction must occur because there's some people in the same room. And that's not the case. It's an illusion of productivity that we give ourselves because it's 100 years old. Um, but right now, we're having some real interesting conversations with people that uh, I think are going to be productive because we're no longer focusing on the output of instruction, you know, the delivery of content by a teacher at the front of the classroom and therefore call it a day. It's good. We can generate A and B from it. And it must be the, the uh, intrinsically good way of handling things. And now we've got people uh, taking a look at our policy 1906 in particular uh, contemplating what it means to satisfy the aggregate hours of instruction and what sort of uh, activities and methodologies in an off-site setting are uh, equivalent to or greater than uh, the assurance that you get in a, a distinct physical classroom with an instructor and a group of students. Um, so I think that those are really big issues on the forefront, uh, particularly for as long as off-site learning is a, is a necessity rather than a convenience. Thanks, Lance. And the School Safety Advisory Committee is, is looking at a lot of these too. So the task force that the superintendent's putting together um, and then coming together with the School Safety Advisory mm -hmm. Committee, hopefully um, sooner rather than later this summer, we'll have some good concrete um, resources for the fall semester. Um, are there updates from any other folks on the line? This is, uh, uh yeah, go ahead, Pete. Well, hi. Yeah. Thanks. Um, appreciate the opportunity. I, you know, kind of dovetailing off of Lance's comments. Um, if there's anything in board of public ed policy or rule that needs to be considered, um, as far as uh, what what he was talking about. I mean, I, I know the board is amenable to looking at those things. So, um, just like to keep that keep that on the forefront as folks are looking at at uh, you know ways to be innovative and so forth. The board has uh, been very uh, you know I, I think has worked well with 
with the education community as far as building flexibility into the standards. So if there are things that, you know, policy-wise you'd like the board to be taking a look at um, in the accreditation or uh, standards, please, uh, you know, keep us, in, keep us in the loop on that. And the Board of Public Ed is gonna be meeting next week on the 7th, just for your information via Zoom. Great, thanks, Pete. Uh, McCall, are there any updates from your office? Thanks, Dylan. Um, I don't have anything now. I was actually, before um, you had mentioned that Dennis was compiling a list, um, I, out of curiosity, was just going to ask if folks had that. I did see something over the weekend on an NBC Montana um, press release that talked about some of the schools. So I'll uh, cross-reference those. Um, and we're just keeping a list just obviously out of curiosity. We don't need it for anything else. Thanks. Thanks, McCall. Well, is there anything else these last yeah. couple minutes? Yeah, Dylan, this, yeah. Uh, this is Kirk. And I just would like to add to that discussion um, that Lance brought to the table about uh, instruction and, and quality of instruction, uh, and also from the Board of Public Ed uh, perspective. Um, having been involved with all of this for nearly 30 years, um, I think that we all need to understand that the administrative rules of Montana and the um, integrity of the Board of Public Education rests in the fact that licensure and accreditation um, are the two measures of quality that we've established in Montana. And so the fact that a teacher does stand in front of a group of 20 students or in front of many students via virtual delivery, uh, it is their license um, and the ability for the Board of Public Ed to be able to protect uh, the integrity of that license and the quality of preparation, et cetera, through the process um, that <clears throat> really delivers um, what the quality of instruction is. And so that has been the default uh, in Montana forever as a result of not having created high stakes testing to determine the output of kids uh, along the way. Uh, and then the accreditation of, of the school itself in meeting both input and um, uh, instructional type uh, administrative rules uh, to gain accreditation is the other check and balance in Montana that's been established. And I think that we need to, even during a time of crisis here, uh, continue to rely upon those, you know, the integrity of the Board of Public Education and their rulemaking authority and their general supervision of schools um, <clears throat> to get us through um, that while contemplating flexibility that potentially is on the horizon. And I'm all for that. I'm all for innovation, I'm for uh, that perspective, but I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, everybody that's involved here at, at this, this level of the organization um, has a pretty clear understanding that um, the administrative rules and the Board of Public Ed and their authority over accreditation and licensure um, are really two very, very important parts of the instructional quality that's delivered in Montana. Uh, that's a really good point, Kirk. Um, is there anything you want to add on that, Superintendent? I just want to make sure that, you know, we want the best. Of course, these are our students, so education may look different. And I'm, I'm hearing what, what Dylan Huskin is talking mm -hmm. about, that is school is a community center. And in Bonner and in Baker, it is. And we need to make, and in Billings it is, in Helena it is. It's still a place where people gather. The learning component of it, not the, uh, the, the question of what that, um, what everything is that fits into that box, it's based on, it should be based on that student. It should be based on that uh, growth and achievement of that student. That's to me what learning is. And I think we're all on the same page. And I, I believe that we can get there. And that's one of the discussions that I brought up having a gathering of of people who would like to see what does that look like going forward. And I tagged on to that the, the legislative body because it is under their purview, understanding that the, the guidance comes from the Board of Public Ed as much as a constitutional body. The funding component of it, the, the, the manner that the legislature works within that, it's exceedingly important. 
and we don't have much time. Uh, we have, we have uh, doors that aren't closing. Remote learning is still taking place. And we want to make sure that when school doors do open in the fall, though, what does that look like under the health and safety and social distancing if that's still in place? Then we have only six months until a legislative session. And I believe that we can put our, our heads together and come up with something that looks at where we've been, where we currently are, where we want to be, and what opportunities there might be to get there based on students. So thank you very much, Kirk, and thank you all for sharing. Yep, Kirk, so just like our federal accountability system is gonna look a little bit different, mm -hmm. our, our state accountability system might also have to look a little bit different, but um, yeah, I agree that's within the Board of Public Ed's mm -hmm. realm, so that's probably, we'll have to have a future conversation mm -hmm. about that. Um, any other updates? All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Um, we'll meet again on Thursday mm -hmm. at the same time. Hopefully we'll have more information about the, our, our CARES Act application on Thursday. Um, and we'll have a little bit more information too from the legislative committees. So. And we are meeting prior to the interim committee. So we, we tried to make sure that we weren't uh, duplicating everybody's calendar with that, but it should be a short and sweet meeting. I'm seeing that these uh, advocate meetings uh, are important. They're important for a conversation, even though they're on a Zoom call. Uh, but I do believe we're going to follow through all the way through May um, and have these on our Tuesday and Thursdays at 1030. So we wish you all the best of health. And thank you very much for uh, thinking, of course, of education and putting our students first. Enjoy the rest of your great day. Thank you.